Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so welcome everyone here. Um, welcome to Racing Healthy Eaters. This is a, a webinar that is going to go uh, through two main topics, a little bit, a very, very little bit about the what um, our little racing uh, healthy eaters are supposed to be eating to, to be healthy. And then um, a lot and 90% of the talk is really about how to get them to eat those foods that we know are healthy for them. So uh, I just mentioned the idea is that the, the main goal here is that you answer, you get your questions answered. So I'm going to go through my lecture, but please raise your little hand on the bottom of the, of the screen if you have a question and you want to interrupt me because I, I want this to be um, something that where people participate. Um, it's really strange to be on the other side of the screen because I cannot read your faces or, or you know expressions and know how it's going. Um, so definitely please raise your hand uh, with any comment, um, things that have worked for you in the past or, or just any question that you have. So just a little bit about who I am. Um, I am a registered dietitian. I've been a registered dietitian for about six years. I started in a hospital setting at Jackson Memorial Hospital with adults. Then I moved on to um, children in the hospital and then I um, joined Education First and started managing their wellness program. Now I am involved in various areas of the business, but always with a focus on making sure that nutrition is a part of, of what we do and of the education that we provide our, our children from zero to five years of age. I manage the wellness program. I have a, a huge emphasis on mindful eating, which we're going to explain. Um, everything here, all the strategies that we're gonna talk about are really focused on that goal of mindfulness, consciousness and in our little ones, because that's really what's going to allow them to be independent and autonomous when we don't have control over them anymore and continue to make the healthy choices we want them to make. Um, so that's who I um, Let me move on. Okay, so um, what are the purposes of today's lectures, as I mentioned? to explore what good nutrition really means for children between the ages of one and five, um, and to understand how that, those strategies of mindful eating can help against peaky eating, or simply to encourage those um, healthy habits that lead to good nutrition. Um, and then ex explore the strategies that, that you probably wanna make um, a habit at home to really create a culture of mindful eating at home. So um, if you want your children to, to think of food a certain way and to be excited about food, there are certain things that we want the home to be promoting uh, in terms of many things, physical um, interactions, and I'm gonna go through it, um, so that you are really promoting that, that, um, that mindfulness and, that, um, and promoting the foods that you want to promote. So we're gonna go through those three things. Um, the little girl on the right is my daughter. I am, I am a mother of, I'm the dietitian, I forgot to mention it, and I'm a mother of, of two, um, two under two. Uh, my daughter who's 21 months and my son who's six months old. And you're going to see a lot of videos of my family and particularly her and other um, children that I know um, because I wanted to make this as real as possible. I don't want to put a bunch of really pretty pictures of families eating together and then, you know, we have to keep it real. So I'm trying to give as many um, real examples as possible of uh, how this works. Awesome. So um, before I start, I think it's extremely important to um, explain what good nutrition really means. So when we say, oh, our children are having a healthy diet, what does that really mean? What are we really saying with that? The first thing obviously means, you know, having the nutrients that they need in order to grow well, um, to grow at the pace they're supposed to be growing for their age, to be development, um, meeting all those milestones that we want them to meet, um, and to prevent disease. So those things we know and are an absolute must when it comes to good nutrition. But there's two other areas that we seldom don't talk about, don't forget, uh, or forget, don't remember, which we cannot ignore in the year 2020. Um, the first one is the other aspect of, of uh, nutrition, which is how is the relationship that we have with eating and with food affecting how we're feeling about ourselves? Um, we don't want to raise children who eat a perfect, 100% perfect diet if, if uh, the way that they're thinking about that food is that it's defining um, their self-worth and who they are. 
right? Uh, we don't want to um, promote that if you maybe ate something that is not supposed to be healthy, like a cookie or a hot dog in a you know fast food place, that suddenly you, you should be conscious of how that's affecting your health, but it shouldn't affect how um, you feel about who you are and that you're a bad person. Or if I see someone who's not following my um, um, diet beliefs, then they're inferior or bad people because that's what's going to create um, problems with body image, potential eating disorders. Um, and even if they're not diagnosed eating disorders, just just this constant fear of food and, and how um, others are um, you know, judging us or we're judging ourselves. So when we talk about good nutrition, we have to talk about what we're eating, but also how we're eating and how that relationship is happening with the food so that we're happy about who we are regardless. And finally, uh, and very importantly, good nutrition also means that it's a sustainable diet for my community. Um, a, a diet that it's not sustainable, that is damaging the world, it really is really not a good diet. And when you look at what we need in our body and what we need to make sure that the world continues to exist, um, they're actually very much hand in hand. We don't have to sacrifice one or the other. So good nutrition means that what I'm putting in my body is good for my body, my mind, and my community. And so we have to have that very defined so that as we go through this talk, all, this, all these topics are gonna be um, mentioned in a way or another. Okay, um, I saw that a lot of people, new people um, came in. I just wanna mention really quickly, if you have any questions, your microphones are off so that we don't have um, interference with your, with your mics and what's going on in your, home, in your homes. But if you have any questions, um, just raise a little hand on the bottom of your screen. And, and Aliyah, who's my helper, is going to um, allow you to talk and, and ask any questions, ask questions throughout, throughout the presentation. Great. Yes, okay. The big picture of what we want to accomplish in our children, we have certain goals for them right now, which we're gonna go through them in a moment as, as children of the ages of one to five. But when we think about nutrition and how we talk to our children and how we create our kitchens and how we um, have our, you know, our dinners and our meals with them, we have to always keep in mind these big pictures that we have um, for them and how we want them to relate to food um, and to themselves as they grow, as they become adults. So we want them to be able to listen to hunger and satiety cues. Um, you know, when we, when we are not capable of stopping, um, or of, of stopping to eat because we're just so excited with the food and we don't hear our, our hunger and satiety cues and say, okay, I've had enough. That's what actually creates a lot of health issues. So we want to be able, we want them to be able to recognize, am I hungry and am I eating because I'm hungry? Am I eating because of something else? And if I'm full, maybe I can stop eating right now and continue with another interesting activity and have another satisfying meal later. So we want them to, to continue to have that um, ability. Um, eating slowly is important because it allows for those hunger cues um, to, to, um, to be mindful about them. Um, feeling, tasting, smelling food before or while you're eating because enjoyment is a big part of what we want them to have, enjoyment of, of mealtime and food. Um, exploring food and where it comes from because we want them to be conscious eaters and informed eaters for the rest of their lives. So that habit of knowing where my food comes from is very important. Um, enjoying a variety of foods because that's what really makes a diet healthy. Um, a diet that has a lot of foods, has fruits, has vegetables, have different types of fruits and vegetables, um, has protein, has all these types of foods so that you can get all the nutrients. So all other things, these are the big picture goals that we want um, to make sure that they have. I want to make a quick note um, to explain what mindful eating is. If I could explain mindful eating in the simplest, simplest of ways, um, I would just describe what goes on when a baby um, is breastfeeding. Um, and that to me is also a, a very important or powerful example of how mindful eating is really the way that we're supposed to eat. When you observe, if you've had the, you know, if you've had the opportunity to have the experience or if you've observed um, a baby who's breastfeeding or even just having their first um, milk, even if it's from, uh, I'm sorry, a meal, even if it's from a bottle and not a breast, you're gonna observe certain things. And that's what really mindful eating is. You're gonna observe that eating is a social experience. 
um, that baby maybe cannot make eye contact yet, but the adult or the caregiver is making eye contact with that baby. There's touching involved, um, there's skin contact. Um, you know, they're, they're listening to your, to your breath, to your, to your um, um, palpitations. There's an absolute social connection going on with food. Um, and that is from the very first moment that we come to the world. It's comforting. It's not rushed or stressful. It's not um, judgmental. It's not about what should be or what is not. It's just comforting. It's a beautiful moment of now. Um, and, and it just brings comfort to us. And it follows those hunger cues that I was mentioning. The baby um, gets fussy when they want to eat. They, you know, they go to the breast or they get the bottle. And then sure, many times they stay there for comfort, but not really for hunger. They stopped eating. So it follows hunger cues, is extremely social, and is definitely comforting. So when we think of, again, mindful eating and how our food environment should be, it should be social. It should be comforting. It should not be stressful. Um, and it should follow our what our body is telling us about the food that we're eating. Okay. So just to keep those goals in mind that we want for our one to five-year-olds to get a little more specific, um, we want, obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning, to create, um, to have nutrition. We want our children to be eating the foods that are proper for them now um, to prevent disease, grow, and everything. But if you were feeding, force feeding your child the perfect nutritious soup every day with every single nutrient, calorie, protein, whatever that you had, and you were force feeding them, I would have to, you know, doubt that that's really good nutrition because what happens with that child becomes independent. So creating habits is one of our most important, um, one of our most important goals right now. It's not just about what they're eating today in the plate. It's about making sure that they, the habits that we have every day, marathon, not a race, the habits that they have, um, they're going to keep and they're going to want to keep as they become independent eaters. Um, that we constantly expose them to many flavors and textures. The younger the child is, the more likely they are to, um, or, or, or the more in development their taste buds are. So the more likely they are to eat a variety of foods as they grow. Definitely the first year is the most important, but as the first five years are still extremely important in those habits and trying those foods and a love for eating, right? So that they can continue those habits. These are the goals that we want for our babies. Not our babies, our children, one to five, not so little anymore. Okay, so as I mentioned in the beginning, I want to spend 90% of today in the how, how do we get them to eat those healthy foods? But I do want to give a moment to the what, because um, just in, in case that there's any questions, I usually find that parents today are very knowledgeable about what children need to be eating. Um, doubts are small, or if there's doubts, they're usually, um, you know, they're right about what they were thinking. So I do want to um, open the floor right now in case there's any particular questions about what you, should your child be eating? Should they be eating this or not that? Can I eat how much of this, how much of that? Um, are there any questions right now about the nutrients or the foods that your child should or should not be eating. And if there are, um, you can just raise the hand on the bottom of the screen. I want to give a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, Nalia will open the mic so you can ask any question that you have about what to eat. Um, just as a summary, if your child is having fruits and or vegetables in every meal um, or, and snack, because they really should be having fruits and vegetables in every meal and snack. If, they ha if they're having dairy, um, it doesn't have to be milk, but um, ideally dairy, um, the ideally yogurt, whole plain yogurt, it's a very good, especially if they're under two, um, less so if they're um, older than two, uh, but that's an important part of nutrition. Um, if the food is mostly homemade, 80% homemade, where we're giving them sometimes things from packages because of convenience, because they really like it, um, because you know they're seeing their friends who like it, and we, we cannot control everything, but uh, then 80% of our food is homemade. And I really highly disencourage juices, um, even if they're 100% like um, natural and all of that, because they're not really that natural. The natural aspect of, of the, the natural thing is the fruit. Um, then we take away the fiber and then we have like a great amount of vitamins with a lot of sugar. 
Um, so if those four rules are followed, your child is most likely following a very healthy diet. Are there any questions about anything in particular? I'm going to assume no, and I'm gonna keep going. Okay, awesome. So that's kind of how the diet should look like. It's very common in the ages um, before five to want foods to be separated. Um, that's why I put these examples here. All of them, as you can see, have vegetables or fruits. Um, they're pretty, ba they're balanced. They have at least three food groups um, and they're separated, not because they have to, but because children less to be, to be a little less picky if you're separating the foods. Awesome, so since there's no questions, which is amazing, um, I'm gonna move on to the how. How do we get them to actually eat the foods that we want them to eat? Okay, so let's start by understanding or thinking a little bit about what do you think food is about for our children? Um, any comments about what you think our, our food is really about for our kids? Is it about eating healthy and um, having a healthy diet and preventing disease later in life? Okay, it's so weird because usually when you have people right there, you have a bunch of, uh, a lot of interaction. So it's weird to just be so silent here. Um, okay, so food, what is it really about food for our kids? I think this picture says a lot. Um, food, I would say it's about three things for children. Um, it's about safety, exploration, and to some level control. Um, children need to feel safe, not only when they're eating, but in their environment, in their everyday environment, they need to feel safe to explore. So we, we want them to um, try different foods or, or eat the foods that they already know, but we want them to eat. Um, there's a, a part about safety that we need to make sure that we are meeting. Um, and I don't mean physical safety, like are they gonna fall from the chairs, but safety in terms of um, those interactions they have with their parents, with their caregivers, with the people around them. Do I feel safe about being judged? Do I feel safe about being able to stay when I'm full and leaving the table. We're gonna go through that a little better um, in, in more depth, but safety needs to be there in order for exploration to happen, um, not only in terms of eating, but in terms of just exploring food. And control, of course, our children are learning that they can be independent, they want to be independent, and they know many times that we get very upset about um, the, the subject of food and not eating. So if we they if they want our attention or simply if they want some independence, you know, control is a part of it. So we need to make sure that we are controlling enough or where we're making sure that it's safe and that they're eating the proper foods, but giving them some sense of control so that they feel like they're not being like held hostage. So those three things uh, we need to we need to meet. Um, to help our children have that mindful um, experience and relationship with food, and then hopefully get them to eat more of the foods that we want them to eat. We're gonna go through the how um, in eight steps. Uh, at Education First in our schools, we talk about the uh, cultural forces, those forces, those aspects that need to be um, in, in an environment, in a place, in a, in a culture, to create the culture that we want. Um, so we're going to go through how to create a culture in the home of healthy eating, of mindful eating, of exploration um, through looking at those eight. So first, let's talk about safety. Um, children need routines and structures to feel safe. Routines and structures do not need to be boring. Uh, they don't need to be, uh, you know, yeah, they don't need to be boring or, or something that we don't like, um, but they, knew, they do need to be consistent so that our children know what to expect. And this is not only about schedules, but schedules is important. Knowing that I'm gonna get, I don't know, three meals and two snacks. Um, maybe they don't know how to count three meals and two snacks, but they know what to expect during the day and that this comes before meals and that meals comes before naps and, um, and they know what to expect. And during this time of quarantine, it's very easy to get out of that. Um, uh, from an environment that they knew, where they knew how their lunchbox looks like, and they know what happens before and after meal times, uh, and what sort of foods I eat usually, and boom, I get into this disorganized schedule that um, 
you know, it cr creates a little bit of stress for me. And it also tells me, oh, maybe I can get away with other things. So routines and structures are extremely important. Um, regular meal and snack schedules. Um, specific places for meals, I think is also important. And I, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be boring. For example, during this quarantine, I created the routine with my daughter of having a picnic for the morning snack. Um, before they wake up, I make her snack as I usually did before in the same lunchbox, similar foods, so that I'm not stressed about what am I going to get you and oh my god, it's meal time and I haven't done anything. Um, and then when she's hungry, like she knows what to expect, she knows that's the lunchbox where she always gets her snacks. And we go and do something different, which because we don't have, you know, we're not going to go in the classroom, but we do something different but fun, um, but it's still a routine that we have. And she knows that's, that's her routine. So um, that makes her feel safe about, you know, what's going to happen. Um, give me one second, because this doesn't allow me. Okay. Uh, I would also argue that foods that usually make the snacks and usually make the desserts and usually make the meals is also good. It sounds maybe obvious, but I don't think it's bad to mention it because um, during this stage, again, they're very little and they're just learning what is the norm. So what seems very natural to us, if we break it a little too often, it's just going to create confusion for them. So knowing that, you know, um, yogurt is not usually lunch, you know, so that when they ask you for, um, I don't know, a cookie at meal at lunchtime, you can say, no, remember, we eat that at so-and-so time. Remember, we only eat that when we go to parties. Uh, remember, we don't eat that at home because we don't, we don't buy that food. It's not good for us and we don't like it. Um, but having very clear, you know, what are the foods that you eat at different times of the day? Um, and finally, you know, something that I see a lot with parents, don't chase them around, like let them come to you. Um, this is the place where we eat. Are you done eating? Okay that's fine. You can step up. Are you sure you're done eating? You're sure you don't want any more? Okay, step down. But you know, that's it. Like we're, we're done eating. We're not going to get food for maybe until next, next snack time. Or if that's not the routine that works for your family, um, you can eat again whenever you want, but this is the food you're going to eat. So you also have to think about what works for you and what you believe as a family. There's not one right answer. These are just examples of what's going to help you create that mindful eating culture. But you have to think about what's, what makes sense for your family and what goes with your family's values. If, um, if your family, for example, uh, knows that they've struggled before with someone in their family having an eating disorder, so they never want to um, force their children to eat um, and finish the plate. So that, you know, you have to have that in mind. But if you're someone who maybe really, really cares about not wasting food, um, then maybe you know, it's a different, it's a different routine, but whatever it is, it has to be clear and children need to know what to expect so that when you want to um, make them, you know, do their routine, it makes sense to, for them. And it's not like, no, I know I can get away with this sometimes. And again, it provides them a lot of safety so that they can then go and, and explore and do the other things that we, the more fun things that we want them to do. Okay. I'm gonna keep going. Again, you can ask me any questions. Um, if, if, um, if you have, just raise your little hand. Okay, so you have your routines and structures and with that very connected to that topic come expectations. Um, expectations again, decrease stress. And there's some expectations that I do want to, um, I do want to promote because of, of the mindful eating culture that we want to, we want to um, do in our homes. Um, so there's certain things that, for example, in my home, we, we have as expectations, trying foods at least once. So maybe you don't have to finish the whole meal. And I feel safe because if I say that this food I really don't like, um, you're, you're left to decide that and to, and to take, make that choice. But we do want you to at least try it, to take the risk. So maybe an expectation could be to try foods at least once. Um, again, do they have to finish meals? Is it an expectation that when you sit down, you finish your meal now and then you have to, you have to go, or is it an expectation that, um, you know, you don't, you don't have to do it all now, but whenever you choose to eat, this is what you're going to eat. What are the expect, what are the expectations that you have and make it very verbal constantly so that your children know, um, what to expect. Um, respect. 
Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, respect for the person who made the meals, respect for the choices that maybe my little brother or sister are making in the table or my dad or mom are making in the table. Respect for the food and where it came from. And so I, the beginning I talked about sustainability and the connection to food. Um, and this has a lot to do with it. You know, we don't throw our food in the floor because someone worked really hard to get that to us. Maybe it's the farmer, maybe it's the cow. The cow worked really hard to, you know, make that yogurt. So um, respect is, a, I think it's a very good um, um, conversation opener to then why we deal with food a certain way, why we don't throw away food, why we at least try the food one time. Um, and it opens the conversation um, in a way that is more about respect and, and how and empathy towards others uh, versus you have to eat that food. Um, so that's a very big, it's a very small word, but it's a very, I think, important topic to have in the table and in the kitchen with, with your children. Um, Again, acceptance of different preferences of tastes. Maybe, you know, my little brother is, you know, learning to grab the spoon and I'm not going to make fun of that. Um, all those things are going to allow the little brother to then have a good relationship with the food. So acceptance of different food preferences. I'm talking all about the home, but when we take this to school, you know, you have all these cultures and all these ways of eating and all of them are correct. So um, that really allows the, the um, culture of mindful eating to extend to, to the home. I see a raised hand from Melissa. Um, can you guys, can you? She makes that question in the question and answer. I'm sorry? She wrote a question. There's a question here. Can you repeat again what you said about if they need to finish the food? Okay, yes, that's a topic I went through very quickly. Um, the first thing I'll say about that is, you know, there's one thing that works for your house and for your home and for your culture, and you need to think about what works for your home. Um, in my professional and now mom opinion um, of what I see happens with children I've, I've you know, been with, or um, um, had patients, uh, uh, children, or as a mom. I feel that when children are expected to finish everything in their plates, there's something that goes on. The first thing is we're not really teaching them to eat based on hunger and satiety cues. Um, what we put on their plate, you know, we might think that's what they need to eat or what will make them full, but it might be too much. Um, it might be too little, it might be too much. So we're disconnecting them from that innate ability that I mentioned at the beginning of, am I hungry? Am I full? So mom, I'm done. Okay. So have the conversation. It's not just, okay, step out of your chair. Goodbye. You're good. No. Um, are you, are you really done? I noticed that you didn't eat much. Um, or I, I don't see what happened. Are you, do you feel full? They'll probably tell you, yes, you feel full. You're not hungry in your stomach anymore. Yes. I'm full. I mean, depends on the, on the age of the child, but you know, the age that we're talking about, if they're passing the 22 month mark, they're probably starting to understand this concept. So um, are you really full? Yes, I'm full. Okay, so I'm gonna, you know, you wanna step down on the table, you wanna leave the table? Yes. Um, okay, but you're not gonna get to eat again, and that's where you decide as a family. You're not gonna get, whenever you want to eat again, you know, this is what you're gonna eat. Or whenever you're gonna, you know, the next time that you eat is gonna be, next next snack which is in about two hours so are you sure you're done and then you kind of give them the autonomy to decide if if maybe they don't want to eat and most likely than not the first days um is not going to work out and you know if if they tend to come back for food because that's what they usually do because they didn't really like the meal that much um they're going to do it and there's going to be maybe a tantrum uh there's going to be you know, she's gonna, they're going to be upset about the fact that they didn't get, you know, that food that they usually get after meals when they say, oh, I'm hungry again. But they're going to learn really quickly that I, I go hungry if I, don't, if I don't eat now or if I don't eat the food that is there. So my, the way I see it, um, we shouldn't really like force our children to you have to finish this or keep going with the, you know, eat that bite for your mom or this one's for your dad or this one, you know, just the piece, just finish your meat, finish your meat. And like, I mean, 
it's you know we again we're not promoting them really thinking about how they how they are feeling physically um i think it's more powerful in the long term because remember we're talking about habits um in the long term to have the conversation of how do you feel and do you really want to make that choice right now and are you aware of the consequences of that choice and sticking as a parent to uh, those consequences whatever you choose them to be so that the child has those expectations which we mentioned before and those routines and structures and then they can make decisions um safely knowing what to expect yeah so i don't know if if i mentioned the if i answer your question um but yeah that's kind of what i mean uh, when i mean when i say that they don't necessarily need to finish the meal and again it's your culture and maybe there's a reason why they should finish their meal maybe they're underweight um and your doctor and you know someone who you're talking to very closely is recommending out you know otherwise and they need to eat and um or you know that they're giving you're giving them very small meals throughout the day because that's the way you want to feed them and so you know that they need to finish this meal uh, but in general my recommendation my my mentality is more of empower them to make the right choices um yeah hopefully i answered the question um, so yeah, that's again with the expectations and how they decrease stress. And again, family culture, what is allowed, what is not allowed. And have in mind their, um, where they are in, the, in their developmental stage, not only because of their age, which, which strongly you know, tells us where they are, but, um, but just from what you know about your child. Is it realistic to expect them to see through to, um, you know, 30 minutes of, of mealtime or not? I don't, I'm not saying they're not, I'm just saying, are they? um is it is it realistic to tell them to eat with their mouth closed when they're a certain age um so having expectations that are realistic and that you have noticed they are capable of doing you've noticed them being able to do it then that's an expectation to have but if they've never been able to is that expectation creating stress so just making sure that you have those expectations that are realistic as a, and that are always there that they become a routine so that your child feels safe Okay, so we covered safety, I think. And again, if there's any questions, I know this is a topic that probably starts making us think and am I really doing this and how about that scenario? Um, then I'm gonna go into the third um, cultural force. So we talked about um, routines and structures, expe expectations, and then we have interactions. Uh, interactions mean interactions with our caregivers, our parents, interactions with our siblings, interactions with our food um, and with our food source. All of those are going to help us have a connection and a positive connection to food. Um, and this goes a little bit more now um, from safety into opportunities for, um, for exploring, but I think it covers both. So interactions, Wh what are my interactions with my caregivers when I'm around food? Uh, whether it's mealtime, whether it's cooking, um, am I, an important part of the process. Am I, am, are my interactions during cooking time, please don't bother me, this is a dangerous place and can someone please take care of you or can you please go to your room because mom is cooking or dad is cooking. Um, what are the interactions with the ch child around, around the preparation and, and getting food ready? What are the interactions during mealtime? Um, is it because of logistics that the child is always sitting alone um, or, or are they having an opportunity to share that valuable time that they so much crave with with their parents, which is not usually um, that much time if they go to school. Now, you know, in quarantine, we have a lot of time together, but usually it's not. So um, are we allowing them to have those positive interactions during mealtimes, during prep time, wherever we have um, interactions with food that is going to encourage them to care and be interested in food? Um, so how are our moods? How are the conversations during mealtime? Are we having really strong conversations? Um, you know, all those interactions, we want to make sure that we are taking care of them um, so, that, uh, so that we can have a positive atmosphere. Um, am I allowed to have an interaction with my food outside of my plate? So, you know, there's things that are safe, there are things that are not safe. Um, maybe I'm not gonna get them to cut vegetables if they're a certain age or the vegetables are hard, but you know they can steer far away from the fire. They can um, they can do different things, which I'm sure that you you, you guys know. But um, they can steer something. They can cut. They can 
help choose what the food is going to be. Um, they can pass things around to mom or dad. Um, you know, I we're talking we're going to talk about the environment, but maybe the safe things, the safe pots and pans, the safe um, items can be at a level of our children so that they can um, help and be little helpers, which is gonna be very, very important um, for them to really care about food and, and be encouraged to, to try food and to, to have a relationship with food. Um, are we giving them maybe once in a while the opportunity to have uh, interaction with the food source? Um, right now in the quarantine is not the right time to think about going to the supermarket and talk about food or to go to a farm. But outside of quarantine, it is. And, um, and if not, can I have maybe a connection to food virtually? Can we watch videos of how um, cow is milked or how um, you know, a vegetable is grown or how it looks in the in, in, in dirt when it's still in dirt? Um, or can I maybe watch uh, something about a farmer and, and, and you know, how their life is and you know, all of that? So allowing for that interaction um, with the food and the connection with the food. Um, is also important and, and it starts, starts the topic of those opportunities, um, opportunities to, to explore food. Okay, so I'm gonna, well, this is a, a video. Um, I don't remember why I have this video here. It's not meant to be anything like um, breathtaking. I'm just kind of showing, uh, I was meant to play this while I was talking. Just showing a, you know, showing a typical interaction of a family where, the children are in the table. They're not kind of farther away. Uh, we're talking with each other. Um, you know, I cannot control everything. So, you know, the croissant on the table is just the croissant on the table. Um, but, but it's a balanced meal. Um, you know, that is there, which is very valuable for them. Um, I'm autonomously eating. Um, maybe I'm asking for help when I need it and I'm provided the help, but I'm just, I look pretty much, I can feel just as capable and independent and grown up as, as, as my caregivers, as my parents. That's kind of what I was trying to show here in a very, very simple video that probably looks nothing different from what um, goes on in your family. Okay. Um, and then I go into my, you know, I start getting to my favorite um, topic, which is the environment and the opportunities. So, an environment that promotes exploration with the food. As we mentioned, children need to feel safe. Um, about the environment they're in, the culture that they're around. Um, and then they need um, opportunities for exploration because everything right now is about exploration. If, if we ask them, for example, to come eat now because um, it's time to eat, but maybe they're building an amazing tower with their Legos and they've never done this before, or they're with their cousins who they haven't seen in a you know, long time, um, you know, we have to put away those distractions or maybe give them a couple of minutes to finish that so that food can be the focus and is not what got me outside of what I really wanted to do. Um, so as not always, it's, that's not always possible, but many times it is if we just stop for a second and think, okay, can they just wait you know, five minutes and finish that amazing tower or that drawing? Or, or can I make sure that eat together so that um, you know so that there's that's a fun interaction uh, between them um, so make sure that the environment promotes exploration and interest um, regarding to food um, the environment in the kitchen again is it promoting them to be little helpers which is so valuable for them um, a stepping stool for example that allows them to reach the level of things or putting things that we want them to reach that um, get them to be involved in the bottom, save utensils that they can use. You don't have to buy some of them, but, or you do if you want to, but there's some they can definitely use that are safe for them. Um, tolerance towards mess. And here, I don't mean that they can take their food and just throw it everywhere because, you know, for the sake of science or, um, or exploration, but, you know, Am I gonna be allowed to explore with eating independently and being allowed to try with a spoon and allowed to try with my hands because at a certain age that's easier and I can still put it in my mouth. Um, so tolerance towards mess, not towards uh, chaos maybe um, or throwing things around because then we go back to respect, but definitely tolerance towards mess or you know um, they're cooking with us or they're preparing with us. And of course it's gonna get messy, but I'm not freaking out about that and I'm not talking to them in a language that is promoting stress about that. Um, 
so that's important to create an environment where they feel safe to explore and that promotes them um, exploring. Okay, no questions. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so again, opportunities to exp so we, we talked about the environment um, and how we set up the environment, um, and then we come to if we set the environment we create interactions between each other. Uh, we have our routines and our structures that we want them to have. Uh, we have set the expectations are clear. We want to make sure that opportunities to explore are there. So we need to create those not just with the environment, but by inviting our children um, to explore to be part of the meal making process. Maybe one day I'm going to tell them what to do and they're going to follow the recipe and they're going to, but maybe one day they get to explore and make and play chef and they're their own chefs and they're making their own meals. And, you know, um, this is a video of my daughter um, making quinoa. Um, this is not how I usually make quinoa. Uh, I usually put it in the fire, but I created the environment and the opportunity for her to have a say on, on how to make this. And was directing her a little bit. Uh, I will say that I did make another batch just in case it didn't want to turn out and nobody wanted to eat it, but it actually turned out fine. She then wanted to put the cheese in it. Um, I didn't say no, you know, it doesn't go with cheese. Like, no, she put the cheese in it. It's not dangerous. Um, it's not necessarily unhealthy. So go ahead and try. And, um, and then we ate it and it tasted fine. And the only thing she wanted to eat that day was quinoa. Um, and she just 20 months old. So um, this is going to encourage them to try the foods. Uh, if we allow them to go in there, um, you know, help choose the groceries if, if they're in the grocery store, uh, you know, maybe um, if they're old enough, they can get off the cart and or they're from the cart, you know, you're going to help me choose the apples because, you know, and I'm going to be right next to you here choosing the oranges, but you help me choose the apples. I need five apples. Choose the ones that are the best for you because tomorrow we're going to have some apples for your snack or which one do you want to have for a snack? And then you choose them. Um, so, so making them part of the person exploring and touching and, and knowing that those are the foods that they chose and that they made part of, and they're going to be much more likely to put it in their mouths and to, um, um, you know, have one. So that's just um, an example of that. I'm making it safe with a stool that helps her reach, but it's also safe. The fire is far away, a little bit longer, but it would have taken me much longer if I was trying to keep her away while I was doing this. Okay. Questions or not yet? Um, this is a video from, uh, not from a daughter, from a friend and, and coworker. Um, and this one I do wanna have sound for. And Aliyah, I don't know if we can have because um, here's another example of how she turned food into play. Um, and she also used um, some of our, our, what we call them thinking keys, which are some tools that help guide the conversation so that it was even richer and more profound uh, to promote um, not only healthy eating, but safety and other things. So I want to show this video, but Analia, how do I make sure that this video has sound? Let's play and we'll see. That's what happened. I don't think it does. Oh, here it goes. I think okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. I'm going to put it from my computer. I remember this was going to happen. Um, I apologize, but okay. Can you see my the video fine? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to play now. So just observe and we'll, we'll discuss later. Oh, and it's in Spanish. Can you, I'm going to translate because it's in Spanish. So she was provided um, lentils, rice, um, something else, I don't know what it is. And she's just playing around with it. So she's talking about where have we seen... Where have we seen lentils before? Can you make a connection with lentils? She's just promoting her to think about the lentils. ¿Dónde las compramos? More profoundly, where do we buy them? Um, Maybe if she'd help them choose, she can remind her that she helped her choose those lentils. She's touching them, exploring them be, before being cooked. Maybe if she cooks this later with her, it's very powerful. En el prr prr. Estás pensando en el coche so are you thinking about the card, the supermarket card? Um, she's modeling because at this age, the child doesn't have that much language, but if your children are older, they're going to have a much richer interaction. And this is what's really cool about this video. So the, the girl Ay, no, decided that she was going to feed the, the dog. So now mom starts... Para que sirve la 
mom takes this opportunity to start talking about food as something healthy because she wants to start feeding the doll. So this is a perfect opportunity because children many times, like at this age, preschoolers, um, working through dolls and, and toys, it's going to be much more powerful than trying to work with the self. Um, so she took this opportunity, which wasn't planned, um, and she starts, you know, um, feeding, feeding the doll and mom starts promoting why um, food is important. What's she going to eat? ¿Qué va a comer la muñeca? Ñam, ñam. Ñam, ñam. Ñam, ñam. Lentils. A ver. Paloma, ¿es verdad que la comida es para alimentar? No. So, is the food for, for, um, for nourishment? Ay, ¿Cómo le parece? How does the doll like the food? ¿Cómo le parece el arroz? ¿Y la pasta? ¿Le vas a dar pasta? Ok. You like the right dish, you're going to feed her um, ¿Se puede atorar? Sí. Ah, está, so, está siendo responsable. That's a pretty cool part. Like, she tells her, oh, she, <coughs> like, so mom takes this opportunity and starts talking about responsibility in terms of food. Uh, so you're being responsible because you're being careful that she won't choke. So you're also, you know, promoting okay. safety through play. Esta es la llave de la responsabilidad, mira. Porque sí, es verdad que hay que, hay que cocinarla antes. Porque está muy dura. So then she starts talking about how, you know, we have to cook it and she probably cooked it afterwards. I don't know, but if you didn't, you know, <laughs> it would be great if she cooks it and then the child can see the change and then we can talk about how it tastes. So it's a great opportunity for promoting tasting something. I know pasta is very common and, and very easy for them to like, but it doesn't have to be pasta. It could be peas. Um, it could be a vegetable that you're going to turn from raw into, into, into cooked like kale or spinach. Um, and just kind of checking out, not making it so much about you have to eat, but look at this food and, you know, oh, you want to feed it to the doll or maybe they don't, but now let's cook it and you get to stare and you get to look and you get to pour the water if you're old enough and then just try it to see how it changed. Let's try it. And that you're promoting so much exploration and um, openness to trying foods through play and not necessarily through telling the child you have to eat. Um, so I thought that was a very, a very um, powerful example. Okay. Um, more opportunities to explore, um, just taking advantage of their interests at the moment. Are they really interested in dipping? So create opportunities to dip. It doesn't need to look this pretty, but um, opportunities to dip fruit or vegetables or whole wheat uh, bread in, in different things. Um, opportunity to make, you know, shapes and that's going to help them and getting excited about the different shapes and trying the foods and putting it in their mouth, um, making healthy little like sandwiches for if it's a meal time because it's a big sandwich or they get their own and, and they start putting in bananas and you know on no sugar peanut butter and just making it a game, having very creative about what is my child really into right now. Um, for example, an, an, something that happened to me. Um, I gave her this uh, opportunity to my child to make the quinoa. So I was like, she's super interested in this. I am so excited. Now we're going to make arepas. Uh, arepas are those corn cakes, if, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, because of course, it looks like Play-Doh. She gets to mix. She gets to get messy. Well, I set this whole thing up and she could care less. She just wanted to eat them when they were ready. She did not want to get messy with her hands, which she did not have an issue with before. Um, and so it didn't work for her. So her interest always is the steering. I don't know why. So I take advantage of that to promote. And you're going to go through a process of trial and error where things don't always work. But being conscious of what is my child into right now? Is are they into maybe something completely different like cars? And I'm going to talk to them about how uh, food gives me energy and how that connects to the cars and they have energy and fuel to go. And, you know, so what are the topics that I'm going to use to uh, play with them and explore food in a different fun way. Um, and again, this, I mentioned before, like asking them to choose and to, and to help you out, to be your helpers. Um, so we went into exploration 
opportunities for exploration, an environment for exploration. We talked about safety and uh, we talked about exploration and those needs. Um, and we also mentioned at the beginning that children have a need for control. And you cannot give them, you know, um, unlimited control because of many reasons, uh, but you can give them the sense of control and some control. These are just examples of meals um, that I have with my child where I am giving her control. Um, I am giving her the, um, obviously, the routine of how a meal looks like, um, but I'm giving her the control of, I'm going to put all of these options in front of you, all of them I'm happy with if you choose, um, but you choose. Um, and I started doing this because um, many times, we, we, first, we don't, we don't have the time, so we're still like, oh, what do you want? A yogurt here. And then, you know, what if they had wanted something else and they would have eaten better if I had provided them more options? Uh, maybe they would have had a better meal. It's less stressful for everyone involved. Um, or if they're in the care of somebody else, um, I already have the set, so it's, I control that it's healthy. I control that she gets control. Um, and I don't have to depend on somebody else maybe making the choices for her and maybe telling me later she didn't eat. Well, maybe she didn't eat because, you know, if she, she eats with this. So it allows me to provide some control um, to her um, in, in a way that, that still allows me to control the nourishment that she gets. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be always like this. It doesn't have to be all in a plate, but mom, I'm hungry, okay. Um, and then you can give her three up. Three is a very good number for options for, for little kids. So um, verbally, you can tell them, okay, you're hungry. Do you want maybe uh, yogurt or you want an apple or you want some, um, some peanut butter and on toast? I don't know. Um, or maybe you want to really promote fruits. So you just give them the option of three fruits or, you know, John, we're going to have vegetables in our dinner tonight. Do you want tomatoes, spinach, or, I don't know, um, celery, I don't know. And then giving them the, that control over, yes, we are gonna have vegetables, but you get to control which one. Um, and maybe you get to control how much, or at least trying it is an expectation, but you get to control to not want to eat all of it and that's okay, but you know, celebrating that they liked it and they have control of stopping. All of that um, is going to take away that stress of um or that or that need to control or that need to say no because i just want to say no to my mom so that i can win this battle <laughs> um that just takes away the battle and and makes it more likely that they'll try foods maybe they won't try it today the first time that you did it but exposing them slowly and kind of watching them from the side to see what they're doing so that you can um you know uh do it differently next time or, or continue to do the same, but letting them kind of be and have their space um, is very important for picky eating. Very important for promoting that independence, that autonomy, and making sure that their, their, um, their habits become habits for life that they continue to maintain. Um, and then they can think in the future about, you know, how avocados are, taste great or how tomatoes taste delicious. And because they were able to try it and, and to get their opportunity to try it independently and with some control. Um, this is a very important part that we often forget. Um, this is a video of just, it's really not that amazing. It's just my daughter eating by herself. <laughs> um, but it's the idea that it's not someone there just feeding her with a spoon uh, and choosing which food she's going to have next. Um, obviously, she's going to get the floor messy and the area messy. Um, there's, you know, different things we can do about that. But she is choosing if this bite is a pasta or this bite is um, a vegetable um, or, or whatever. Um, so there's some control there. Is she maybe going to have every single vegetable that I put in the plate? No, but she's neither gonna do it if I try to force it. She's gonna stop, she's going to fight, she's going to say no, and there's gonna be, you know, uh, a, a situation that is not fun for anybody. So she, at least she had some. Uh, remember the long-term goal, it's not just to have her eat vegetables now. Um, maybe um, I do other things to make sure she has her vegetables. So I provide her the control, and then maybe at dinner, there's a vegetable soup where it's, she loves, and it's so easy to just make sure that she has all the vegetables. But throughout the day, I gave her this autonomy to choose 
um, how much and if to put those foods in her mouth. Uh, but I continue to promote them, so I control that. But she decides, um, you know, if she if she wants to eat and how much she wants to eat. That's kind of what I wanted to show with this very simple video. And as you can tell, that was a long time ago. That was in Christmas. <laughs> so she was about 19 months, I guess. Um, yes. Um, and then uh, we're, I don't want to go over time. Okay, we have like four minutes, but this topic is extremely important. And I want to show you a very, very, very powerful video of one of our teachers um, modeling the language and using the language that you guys really want to incorporate. So we talked about that perfect environment, that amazing environment, that safety feeling for the children, those opportunities that you want to provide. Um, but all of this should really go with, um, with a certain conversation that you want to have with your children. Um, and the conversation has to be very positive and it has to promote those things that we already mentioned. We, it has to promote the exploration. It has to promote the positive relationship with food. It has to promote um, the, the, the sched, not the schedules, the routines and the structures that we mentioned, uh, but it has to be very positive. So celebrating good behaviors. Um, taking risks is one major behavior that you want to celebrate. If your child decides to try one carrot and not try any other carrot or any other spinach leaf or anything else, do celebrate that. Let them know that you're very happy and very um, um, proud that they took the risk and that initiative to do something that is scary. So risk taking, always saying, well, you took a risk and try something new um, or, okay, you didn't like it. Well, at least you tried it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. You tried it. And that's going to encourage them to try something different next time versus you just ate one. Come on, try it. It's good for you. It's delicious. Mommy likes it. Daddy likes it. You know, well, I don't like it. So, um, you know, I'm an independent being. Um, independence is another behavior that you want to promote and that you really, you're promoted with the environment, with the opportunities, but with your language. Uh, wow, you serve water for yourself and you helped us out with solving water. Uh, you, wow, you're able to spoon feed it by yourself, that whole spoonful of rice. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so the language also has to encourage all those positive things that we want, collaboration, or um, when they show respect for a food, you can make it obvious. Look, um, your brother, you know, is being very um, empathetic about, you know, um, the farmers and, you know, thinking about them when choosing not to throw food on the floor. Something like that, making uh, visible, we say, uh, making visible, make it evident the, those behaviors that you want through talking about them and through mentioning them. Um, again, same thing with the behaviors, promote acting based on hunger cues. Are you still hungry? Does your tummy feel hungry? Or, oh my God, fool, that's a horrible, horrible um, mistake. <laughs> Um, that's a horrible spelling mistake. Okay, so are you hungry or full? Um, um, yeah, I got distracted with that. Okay, so are you feel? Do you feel hungry? Do you feel full? Do you, are you sure that you're done with eating? Um, those things you want to promote. Maybe every time, every time they want to leave the table, or every time they ask for food, just saying it's not that you don't believe them. You just want to make them think about what is it that they're feeling. Just uh, go through the. Um, get them to, to think and to um, evaluate for a second, how am I feeling? Mom, I want a yogurt. Oh, really? Are you hungry? Your tummy feels hungry? Yes. Okay, let's have a yogurt. Or you can have a yogurt or let's have a fruit or, you know, the other things we talked about. But talking, very important to talk about what's going on and what you want to happen. Um, and another very good tool is needs versus wants. So mom, I want, you know, I want ice cream. Okay, you want ice cream, but need versus so talking to them about how water is a need because it's uh, something that leads to hydration, but maybe juice or uh, um, soda is a want because it tastes good and maybe we can have it in parties, maybe you can have it once in a while, but it's really more of a want. So we're going to treat it as a want and we're going to have it once in a while, um, but water, we know we need it because we need hydration. Um, or ice cream, okay, you want an ice cream, but we need nourishment. We need to eat healthy. So we can have an ice cream later. Um, it's not because it's a reward because you finish your vegetables, but it's because it's a want. 
And the need, really, what our body needs is nourishment. So let's think about what our meal is going to look like so that we meet that need of nourishment, and then we can have our want. It's another very important tool, um, very powerful tool that you can use to have a com positive conversation that provides autonomy and provides them to um, become independent in the way they think about food and the, their approach to food. Okay, to finish, um, I just want to show, um, well, the thinking keys which you all have uh, shared to you since this quarantine period started are very good conversation promoters, um, uh, conver promoters of deep conversations as the one that I just mentioned because sometimes we don't know as parents what to say anymore or other than this food is really yummy and do you like it and uh, corn is yellow. So these give you those tools um, to have those deep conversations if you want to promote something like um, healthy eating. And I wanna show you quickly um, the video of the teacher that I mentioned, which I also have um, in my computer because it's too large and I couldn't put it. Um, because I think it's very powerful and I want you to notice all the behaviors that she's encouraging. Um, yeah, all the behaviors encouraging and how positive she is constantly around the topic of food and about what the children are doing. So I'm going to let you watch this video. Um, if, if you don't hear it or something, let me know. Well, whose name is this? Please. So they're starting with one of the routines yeah, instructors. Mateo, we're giving out the spoons. They're showing responsibility, and you'll each get a turn like we always do. James, Being very vocal about Abigail, what they're doing right. These good helpers showing responsibility. What is the habit of mind that we use when you taste something? Take what? Take a what? Take a risk. Take a risk. Alexander, let me see you take a risk and eat one carrot. Are we eating fast or slow? We're going to be mindful. No. Slow. Eat slowly. That's mindful eating. Eat slowly. Let's think about it. What do we have that's showing a balanced meal? Rice. Rice. And what does rice do for our bodies? It gives you energy, right? Did you hear what he just said? He made a connection. He said, when I eat rice, it gives me energy like a what? So she also made like a race car. I love that analogy. See? She's using their interest to promote. I don't know what this mm -hmm. is. This is something new. What is this? I thought we were having black beans today. I was wrong. Good guess. Plantain. Plantain. What fruit is a plantain? A banana. Are we all going to take a bite of the plantain? Because the plantain is our balanced meal that's giving us our food. Where do carrots come from? So she's talking about food source and the connection with food. Where do carrots come from? Farmers, yes. Farmers, and they can talk about you farmers. Guys are eating a balanced meal. What else? Think about it. What did we do outside? We ran, and what is running? Making connections with other healthy habits. And then that final routine of structure of, you know, everybody helps. So I just wanted to show you that because I think it's um, the ultimate. Um, example of how we want to talk to our children um, and to treat mealtime and anything related to uh, around food. Um, the last two are just very quickly, obviously the way you, the, your relationship with food matters. Uh, we know that, and I'm not saying anything new, if I tell you that if you eat vegetables, they'll eat vegetables, and if you drink water, they'll drink water, and if you drink soda, they're gonna ask you for soda. But apart from that, what we want you to model is not only the eating, but the relationship with the food. What is your relationship with food? How do you feel about food? Are you, you know, how, what is your relationship with food? Guilt, pleasure, happiness, um, you know, what is it? And that is very important to model to our children. And finally, um, just making sure that you have the time, that you, not that you have the time, but that you give the time. Um, for these opportunities and for these conversations, because uh, if we don't plan for them, then we're going to be rushed and we're going to be stressed and they're not really going to happen or if they happen, it's not going to be sustainable. So that is the last thing that you have in mind. 
Um, and you know that that concludes my presentation. I went a little bit over time, um, but I'm here. I'm here for the next like 10 minutes. So if there's any questions about anything or you want me to go through anything, um, let me know. Thank you so much for here for being here. Um, and and I just hope that you got something out of this uh, of this talk. It's been recorded. Uh, I believe it's going to be shared in, you know, it is going to be shared in our Facebook groups and I am giving this talk again next week at night in Spanish. So in case that you know somebody who prefers it or, or wants to watch it again, um, this talk will be in Spanish next Thursday. Um, I don't remember if it's at seven or at eight. I think it's at seven. Yes, it's, yeah, I don't remember. But, um, but we're going to tell you soon, but it's next eight. Thursday. It's eight? Eight. Eight, sorry. So next Thursday at eight in Spanish, same talk, but in Spanish. So thank you so much for your time. I'm just gonna be here just for a little bit in case there's any questions and that's it. Have a wonderful day and uh, enjoy the quarantine to, to maybe um, try these things now that we're at home anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs>